Hi, y'all. Happy Monday. Um, checking to make sure I'm actually like talking and making sound because that would be unfortunate. How is everyone today? It's Monday. It's our last week of school. I cannot believe that we haven't been at UNF for like weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. It feels like a hundred years, right? Um, so let's see what other excitement do I have for you? Uh, it was a pretty lazy weekend. I made cookies again. This weekend I made, y'all get ready for this. They're chocolate brownie cookies. They are, they're one fantastic. And if you're interested, send me an email. I would stop. So let me make sure everything I need is up and ready. So hopefully you guys are ready for the end of the semester. I'm not going to lie. They're so good. I thought about bringing like to show you my cookie, but then I would have eaten it and eating on camera is just not, it's really not the best. Um, hopefully you guys saw that your exam threes have been graded. Um, both the multiple choice, the canvas part and the short answer part. Um, it is my understanding based on what canvas said that, so I wrote on them the same way I would have, and you should be able to see that on the uploaded short answers. If that is not true, someone can drop a comment. I will check into this as the day goes on. Um, so there's that. Let's see, regularly scheduled announcements. We have class today and on Wednesday. Um, we will talk about chapter 10. If we don't get all the way through it, we'll just let it go. We are only intending to cover 0.1 to 0.6. So the latter part of the chapter, we're not going to talk about it at all. Um, so don't even worry about that. Um, if you read the announcement I sent on Friday, which it's the end of the semester, we're all getting a little like bogged down in the details. Um, so I did take away the last knowledge check. So usually we learn material, then we have a knowledge check, and then it take stuff away from you. Um, so in this case, there are no more knowledge checks. So your goal, I don't want to say should you choose to accept it because that sounds super cheesy, but if you would like all of the Alex Pi points, you need to have completed your Alex Pi by Monday at 3 p.m. Not, not today. So you have one week. Um, there are objectives due on Friday. So if you would like access into anything else, you must finish those first. Um, but, so that's happening. So I think there are 10 objectives for this chapter. They are just all due on Friday. Then you have open pie from Friday until Monday, which is when our final is. So information about the final will be, the final information about the final will be provided on Friday. It will be very similar to exam three. Ooh, hey, thank you for checking that you can see the written corrections. Um, I was pretty sure that you could. So I tried to write on there and make scores. If I did bad math, please let me know. Or if you have questions about any of that, please. Final, I'll give you the final information about the final. So bad internet connection. I will give you the final information about the final on Friday. So we have a question about Alex. Do topics have to be learned or mastered for complete Alex Pi points? So, okay. Um, for Alex, they have to be blue of some variety, either learned or mastered. So there are no more knowledge checks. So you will just learn everything else. Um, this way with kind of everything else that's going on, I don't want to overburden you guys to have one more knowledge check where you you could possibly lose your information. Um, Sebastian, I did see your email. You will get a response today. Um, I, I will contact you in a little bit. Um, Ginger asks, for practice, if you do old Alex objectives that we have 100% on, will it take points away? No, no. 
I know that sounded more like no question mark. So if there are no additional knowledge checks, it can't take anything away from you. So it is my understanding that you should be able to go into the review section and review any topics that you have interest on and you'll be able to do that. Um, the other thing is some of you have filled it out, but there is a Google survey um, attached to the Friday announcement. It will also be on the announcement slides, which I haven't posted yet, but I will. Um, I am looking for feedback. It asks super easy questions. Easy is maybe not the right word. Um, hold on, I'm pulling it up. So it asks like, did you look at the slides? What resources did you use? Um, lots of other type questions. This is totally anonymous and it is optional. Mostly I ask you to do it so that if um, there have been changes in what students want, I don't really know what you need in that case. Um, but if you would prefer some other type of resource, this is your chance to tell me anonymously um, okay. Will the final be longer, but same time limit? So the final, um, if we had taken it on campus, you would have more time and it would be longer. So likely it will be somewhat similar to that. So it will be longer. You will also have longer to do it. Um, Aaron asks, are we going to have a mock final at NSI? I don't think Megan had sent out her SI links for the week, um, but you can contact her. Um, Michael, I will also respond to you and you guys can set up a time for those appointments. Um, sorry, it was a kind of crazy afternoon trying to get everything done. I am behind on emails. Um, so if you've emailed me today and I haven't gotten back to you, it is forthcoming. So. Any other questions? I will tell you everything about the final. Um, likely I will post a video link for you guys because I think that works a little bit better than trying to do the writing. I will do both in that case. Um, I am looking into a couple of things on Canvas trying to make sure it works. But it will be very similar to exam three in the like Canvas format. So what you guys might notice on the so on Canvas, there's the answer for the fill in the blanks. Some of you will notice that you got points for stuff it marked wrong, or you should notice that. Um, if it asks which direction does the arrow point and you wrote out like the arrow points to chlorine, which is totally correct. Canvas is not smart enough to know that that's what you said. Um, open pie for Alex opens again on Friday. So you have chapter 10 objectives that are due this week and then your other things. Um, Megan says TBD on the final. She will send you a Canvas announcement. She and I will coordinate um, to kind of make sure we are rowing the same boat. The okay. And that's the optional one, just like all the other ones on Canvas. Um, so, Sarah, I'm with you. Um, I'm there, there is not that type of presentation in Gen Chem 1. The assignments that you have left, we have equipped this week that will run like the others. We have Alex and we have the, the final exam. I, I'm not saying that that's someone who maybe isn't a student, um, but I don't know what oral presentation. Um, if you got accommodations on exam three, then I have a note and you will get the exact same types of things for the final. So you are welcome to send me an email about that um, if you'd like to, but you don't have to. I made what I think are good notes and those will happen as well. Any other questions before we talk about chapter 10?
Um, it is unlikely that I will post a comprehensive review sheets. Um, there are review sheets for each chapter. Um, and so my suggestion would be to go back through and do all 10 of those or to pick the ones that you know were the most complicated. So the one that I would, I would look at number th chapter three, just because limiting reactants are coming. You could also do, I would do chapter three, chapter nine, chapter five, because everyone hates the math and calorimetry. So I would do that. Um, you could also check out the YouTube problems if you're looking for other things. Any other questions? So I did post the chapter 10 handout the other day. Um, so let me pull up my slides so I can follow along while we look at it. Sorry, we're gonna have to reorganize the deck in here, give you guys a better view um, because everyone needs to see her. Here's Lil. Um, those twitches are because she's dreaming. She is out like a light. She's been napping off and on all day today. I think there were some storms last night and thunderstorms make it hard for her to sleep. So. Oh, so Katie asks, do you like ISQs to be filled out? I do. Um, ISQs are great. Um, I just find that they ask you a bunch of questions that are not what I actually care about. Um, so if you looked at the survey, I asked things like, what resource did you use? I'd like it if you filled out both. If you only fill out one, that's up to you. Um, the Google survey has questions like, what should I never change about this course? What should I definitely change about this course? Um, those type of things. Or, and the ISQs are the same as everything else. So go ahead and you can fill out both. You can fill out one. You can fill out none. It's just different information in each one. So, all right. If you have other questions, feel free to answer or ask them in the box and I'll give them an answer. So, I think we'll just do this. Okay. So today we're going to talk about chapter 10. And so chapter 10 is about gases. And so gases are in the South, we use the word gas to really talk about the stuff that we put in our car, right? Like gasoline. In gas and chemistry, the talk is, or the ability of state of matter to be gas. So gases have a couple of characteristics. So in section 10.1, we kind of want to think about that. I'm sure you guys can see this over right here. Yeah. So gases will fill any container. And so they will fill the containers. They tend to create, I'm sorry, honey, homogenous mixtures. So what that means is when you mix two gases together, if you want to think about the air in my, in my house or in your house or anywhere else, it really is a general mix. We have oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, water vapor, because this is Florida, and y'all, it is humid. So all of that mixes in the air together. So um, the other thing is we can also have vapors. So we know what water vapor or steam 
we know that that's a gas. And so when water goes into the air, we have this water vapor or just like regular Florida air. So the other thing with gases is they're highly compressible. Oops. So we know or don't know, when we think about gas, you can buy a cylinder of gas. And so that gas comes out at a high pressure. It is because it's overpacked. So, I mean, I haven't gone on a flight in months, right? Because we're all stuck at home. But when I pack, I sit on top of my suitcase and zip it. And I do that because you can squash more stuff in there, right? So when you get where you're going and you unzip your suitcase, I can only speak for my own life. But when I do that, it just kind of explodes because I compressed all of my clothes and the shoes and everything else into the suitcase. So gases can be compressed even more than that. We basically take a volume of air and shove it inside a container to where it's at a high pressure. This is why balloons explode or other things. And so there is a tension between the balloon and the environment. And those two things allow that to interact. So when we think about gases, so if you're following along on the slides, that was slide three. Now we're going to look at slide four. So slide four starts to talk about so talk, pressure. So 10.2 pressure. So when we think about pressure, we know that pressure is it isn't, it isn't, isn't something, but pressure can be determined. It is equal to the force over the area. So if you, by any chance, are taking physics this semester, a long time ago, next semester, other times, people calculate the pressure, like how much pressure, if, so I'm, if you stand on top of something, it is the force, which can be rel relative to the weight, over the area. So in that case, it is basically calculatable in that way. And so in this case, we're never really going to calculate it that way. We are going to think about it more as gas exerts a force on the container. And so we know that there's this thing called atmospheric pressure. Here in the south, in Florida, in, I don't want to call it Hurricane Alley, but where there are hurricanes, we know that the atmospheric pressure changes when a hurricane is coming. We know that when they are, a front comes through, the pressure is going to change. And so we, we know that there is an atmospheric pressure. If you lived on the top of a mountain, you would have a different atmospheric pressure because you're at a different height from the ground. So pressure is a general term that can be related to force over area. So you can think about the pressure that something exerts on the ground. Or in this case, and for the entire, how much gas or the pressure of a gas. So if we switch to slide five, we can think about the scientific unit for pressure. So a some pressure unit, so the Pascal is the, SI unit for pressure. But in many cases, kind of like how in the US we use feet or inches, most people don't tend to calculate pressure in Pascal. We just don't. Per meter squared. So if you are, um, or if we think about this, so Newton's is a unit of force divided by the area of a situation. So we're not going to calculate it this way. But one bar, so bar sounds a lot more like barometric pressure. Duh. Yeah, we also use PSI or KPA. We're going to use some other ones here shortly. Um, so one bar is equal to 10 to the fifth. Pascal. So the thing with pressure units, the distance between those two is the same. It just has to do with what unit we're going to use. 
So if we look at, or if we start to think about, so on slide six, it starts to ask, how do we measure a gas? So we're gonna measure it doing using the pressure. So the thing with gases, or the way we wanna think about that, is Evange, Evange, Evangelista Torricelli. So Torricelli comes along and wants to measure the pressure. So the way he started to think about that was how can we measure that in such a way that I, that he could make a measurement and relate it to another scientist somewhere else. Because scientists, even today, were socially apart, in that case due to distance, not due to pandemics, but they were apart, and so we want to know if the measurements taken in Europe relate to the measurements taken in the United States or in Italy to France or other types of things. So Torricelli developed the first barometer. Now, a barometer is likely a term that you've heard because barometers basically are different. It is a measure of pressure. So when you watch The Weatherman, he talks about the barometer. If you go, in this case, to my grandparents' house, they have a barometer sitting on the outside, and it tells them things. So Torricelli comes along and develops a barometer. So Torricelli uses a very long sealed glass tube and inverts it into a tub of mercury. So this is mercury. Now, we hopefully all know that mercury is rather dangerous. Now, this is clearly the olden days. So in the olden days, mercury, and to be clear, the olden days was not that long ago, for the mercury. Mercury is the only metal that comes as a liquid. So that makes it kind of cool. You could, please, put in your hand, and it'll kind of be function like liquid, kind of like a very, you can get a bead of mercury to play in your hand. To be clear, that is very dangerous and a very bad idea. But this was before that. So he takes his very long tube and then he inverts it. And so this tube here would fill with mercury. And this tube is 760 millimeters. So then he could measure the height of the mercury as the atmospheric pressure. Make that look a little bit more like a P. So when we write capital P followed by subscript ATM, so this is atmospheric, atmospheric pressure, P-R-E-S-S. Atmospheric pressure pushes on everything and can be relative. So atmospheric pressure at sea level is one atmosphere. Atmospheric pressure at the top of, we'll go with Mount Everest, is going to be less. So Mount Everest has less atmospheric pressure than the sea level. So we would expect to see a change in how much mercury has gone up or down this tube. So on slide seven, it shows that there are five different units for pressure. So 760.0 millimeters of mercury equals 1.00 atmospheres, which equals 760 torr. And torr is named after Torricelli. And 101.325 Pascal also equals 1.01325 bar. So you may be starting to go, uh, do I have to memorize this museum in a way so that you do not need to memorize these, but we can use it just like a unit conversion. Now, unit conversions. That's chapter one where we would take inches and convert to meters. So you can just equate any of these together. So this equal sign, so they're all equal to each other, tells you that 760 millimeters of mercury also equals 1.01325 
far. So we can change any of those around if you want it. So from here, we want to start to talk about the gas laws. So gas laws are probably things you've heard about before. Likely, if you took intro chem at UNF, or if you took high school chemistry, you've heard the expression PV equals NRT. Or some people like to call it PIVNR. I don't really care for that one. That's not my favorite. Um, but I do like a good PNR, NRT comes from. What about a manometer? So manometers are pressure measuring devices. So the question is, what about a manometer? So a manometer is a pressure measuring device. And so you can measure those in different ways. And so I think the question is asking, how can you measure this? So manometers can measure enclosed gases. They can also be used to measure gas flow in line if you have some sort of a device in that way. So we could use a manometer to measure the gas flow if you were to open a valve, or you can apply a pressure, either positive or negative, where you push or pull the air away. So the thing we want to think about now is the gas laws and how did those come to be? So in the 1660s, scientists started to think about gases. Now, the 1660s, there was no internet. There was no, we'll just call these gas laws. So in the 1660s, scientists used a little bit more pattern recognition as a method for scientific investigation. So today in my research, I tend to ask scientific questions. Questions. So this is the 1660s did the same thing. They asked what happens to the pressure of this environment if we do it in different entities. So today we're gonna talk about four different laws and laws are, are a little bit I think laws can be misleading. I think what I would say, so the term laws, when we think about gas laws, can be a little misleading. I think it's maybe a better way for students, for us to think about it, instead of a law, a relationship. So we're going to talk about four laws today, Boyles, Charles, Avogadro's law, I there were four, maybe there are only three. Boyles, Charles, Avogadro's Law, and the other one. So first up on slide nine is Boyles' Law. So Boyles states, the volume of a fixed quantity of gas at a constant temperature is inversely proportional to pressure. So what this, yeah, we're going to talk about absolute zero today, but we may also be missing one of the laws. We'll come back to that. So it's proportional to pressure. And so that means that the volume equals a constant times one over P. So inversely proportional basically means it's not V volume equals P. It means that volume is inversely relation, relationship to pressure. So if the pressure doubles, the volume decreases by half. And so if you're looking at the slides on slide nine, there's a graphic that tells you that if you increase the pressure, so if we double the pressure, the volume gets shrunk by half. 
And so in this case, his law also states we can rearrange this to equal that VP equals constant. And so one of the things you might be asking yourself is like, but what is this constant? And so it turns out that this constant isn't part of how we use Boyle's law. Boyle's law is how we can derive the PV equals NRT equation. So many of you want to put the gas law constant here, and that's not what this means. So in this case, we are getting there. So the next law we want to think about is Charles's law. So Charles has to do with the temperature of gases. So Charles's law tells us that the volume of a fixed of a the volume of a fixed amount of gas at constant pressure is proportional to the temperature. So this tells us that the volume of a fixed amount of gas at constant pressure to the temperature. So here in here in Florida, one of the things we don't really experience is what happens when it cools overnight. So it's currently April, it's already hot here, but we know that in winter, for Florida winter, when it gets cold, a lot of times the tire pressure alarm comes on. At colder temperatures, the balloons contract because the gases don't wiggle around as much, so they take up less volume. Hot air expands. Sorry. So as hot air expands, this might work better or not at all. So as hot air expands, what we tend to see is that it gets, so hot air expands. And so in this case, for Charles's law, the volume over temperature is equal to a constant. So is Bari asked, um, sorry about that, did not realize I was just standing in front of the board. Um, so is Bari asked, isn't the constant value just the answer to the question? It can be. So, but the thing with this is just dividing two numbers. We could divide any two numbers and get a, a value. So this is telling us that if we have the volume at one temperature and then at a different temperature, those two values are going to be related to one another. So when we think about gas laws, what we really want to think about is that we want the opportunity to be able to relate what happens at one temperature or volume to something else, as opposed to just thinking about if we divide two numbers, what do we get? So temperature in this case is always in Kelvin. And it's, whoops, sorry. No, it's a good question. We haven't really talked about how to use the numbers yet, so it's a great question. And we'll talk about what units, but temperature is always in Kelvin. So the reason it's in Kelvin, if you look at slide 11, so for absolute zero, Charles's law discovered absolute zero. So the Kelvin scale is derived out of this. So absolute zero, which is zero Kelvin, is the moment in which a gas has zero volume. Now, one thing we can really think about is you can't really compress something to nothing, right? That's not really a thing. But what the Kelvin scale tells us is that at zero, at negative 273 degrees Celsius, what we expect is for all motion 
and the gases to fully stop. So in this case, we can calculate Kelvin temperature. It's Celsius plus 273. And so in this case, we can think about this constant. So absolute zero is derived from that. So the next thing we want to think about is the next law. So I know that it feels like we're moving through these quite quickly. And I like to think of these more as situational environments for how these were developed. So these, turns out it's three. I thought it was four. My brain is, it's the end of the semester. Um, but these three laws allow us to create the ideal gas law equation. So the last law we want to think about is Avogadro's law, which is on slide 12. So. So Avogadro is probably someone that you maybe remember. So we know for him from Avogadro's number, um, which is 6.02 times 2 times 10 to the negative 23rd. So it tells you how many atoms or molecules are in a mole. So Avogadro is also responsible for realizing that the volume of a gas at constant pressure and temperature is directly proportional to the number of moles. So that says the volume of a gas at constant temperature and pressure is proportional, bless you Lily, to the number, so the volume over N equals constant, where N is equal to the mole. So N is the acronym that we use for moles. In this case, somehow that still does not look like an M, but it is. So moles being like one mole of sodium chloride or any of these. So Avogadro's law basically says that if you put twice as much stuff inside a container at the same pressure and temperature, so now it's going to have twice as much volume. If we think about this from a practical standpoint, right? If we were to think about the quantity of, let's just say iron. If we have five grams of iron and then we increase that, now I have 10 grams of iron it's going to take up twice as much space. So Avogadro's law is basically saying the more volume of something you have, the more space it's going to take up. So, well, the more moles you have, the more space it takes up. And so the more space it takes up, the more moles you likely have. The important thing with many of these equations or these laws is that the constant temperature and pressure is super important. So most of these laws are not things that we really solve for in terms of how these things all come together. So very, very, very rarely, very rarely, do we actually use Avogadro's law and run a calculation? Because most of the time we think about Avogadro's law in terms of PV equals NRT or in what we will call, or what I will call deviations of the gas laws. So places where you can say, okay, not this or this. So next, what we want to start to think about is how do these three laws come together to give us PV equals NRT? So we know that we have these three laws and we know that they all connect. So if you now look at slide 13, it tells us a couple of things. So we know that P over PV is equal to a constant. We also know that volume over temperature is equal to a constant. And we know that volume over N is equal to a constant. So 
when we think about this, one of the misconceptions is that these constants are necessarily all the same thing. But we can rearrange this equation using not necessarily algebra, but the ability to manipulate equations. You could solve them all for B or and do some replacement. But what we will come to see when we manipulate these equations is that volume is equal to a constant times N T over P. But likely we tend to see it a little bit more where it looks like this, PV equals N R T. So the thing that we kind of want to think about, let me step out of the screen, is that P is equal to pressure, V is the volume, T is the temp, N Kelvin, and N is the moles, and R is a constant. So PV equals NRT tells us that for a given situation, if you have any three, you can calculate the fourth one. Kind of like density, right? If you have the density and the mass, we can determine the volume. So PV equals NRT is going to allow us to do calculations about this. So if you pop on to slide 14, you can see table 10.2 which is the numerical values of the gas constant R in various units. So PV equals NRT allows us to calculate the ideal behavior. Now R is a constant. So it'll either be provided to you on an equation sheet or somewhere else for like, you know, the quip on Wednesday. Um, so the quip will be over the ideal gas law, which we are about to talk about. So if you want to make a note of this, um, it will also be included in the announcement slides. So in this case, PV equals an RT. These are the five things. And then we have R. Now, R units could be in liters, atmospheres, moles, Kelvin. Good use. You could also find it in liters, tor, moles, Kelvin. No, you do not, definite no on the memorization. Ah. Memorize. That's not how you spell that word. But, that's okay. So no, it would be provided either on an equation sheet or in a table for you for both the quip and for the exam. So the ideal gas law is going to allow us to think about this in that way. So most of the time, my personal preference is to use R equal to 0 0.08206 liters, atmospheres, moles, Kelvin. This is just the one that I am the most familiar with. It is the one that I like, but that doesn't mean that you have to use it. There are other ones that you can use. So I think next we're going to do two examples. So as soon as I find the paper. So the first question says, and I'm on slide 15 if you're following along. It says calcium carbonate, CaCO3 solid, is the principal compound in limestone. And it decomposes upon heating, so it's a decomposition reaction, to calcium oxide plus carbon dioxide gas. So CaO solid plus CO2 gas. A sample of calcium carbonate is decomposed. After the carbon dioxide is collected in a 250 ml flask, the gas has a pressure of 1.3 atmospheres at a temperature of 31 degrees Celsius. How many moles of CO2 gas were generated? So, due to the fact that this board is quite small, um, I am going to, not going to be able to write the problem up, but it's on slide 15. So 
a couple of things. I'll try to highlight it as we go along, but the one thing when you look at some of these problems, I've tried to incorporate as much review as possible. So you could write a balanced chemical re a balanced chemical equation for this problem, or you could think about some things like that. But the things that we want to be able to think about today are how many moles of CO2 gas were generated. So one thing with ideal gas questions is there's a lot of data in the problem. So if you remember back to chapter five, I would write off to the side all the things I know and kind of figure out like, okay, I know this, how do we go back? So in this case, we know based on the problem that pressure equals 1.3 atmospheres. Okay. We also know that temperature equals 31 degrees Celsius. So 31 plus 273.15 Kelvin gives us a value of 304.15 Kelvin. So we have two of the three. So we're going to use PV equals NRT. Now we know based on the question that we're going to solve for N. So we know R is going to come from the table. We have temperature, we have the pressure, but the volume. So one of the things that I and Alex will do is basically it will say in the problem, it's collected in a 250 ml flask. So in this case, it tells you the volume of the flask. Unlike liquid, we assume that we know volume is equal to 250 mils. So the R value that I want to use is 0 0.08206 liters, atmospheres, moles, Kelvin. So if this is the value we want to use, we have atmospheres, check. We have Kelvin, check but our volume is not in liters. So we do need to convert from milliliters to liters. So our volume is going to come 0 0.250 liters. Oops, that's too many sig figs. So now we can start to set up an equation. So N is equal to PV divided by RT. So from here, we can then keep writing. So we can solve with 1.3 atmospheres times the volume, which is 0.25 liters, divided by R, which is 0 0.08206 liters times atmospheres, divided by moles, Kelvin, multiplied by our temperature, which is 304.15. So now we can plug this back into our calculator. So a couple of things as a couple of reminders about calculators. Parentheses are always your friends. So we want to divide these two things. So when you plug that in, you should get N equals 0 0.013 moles of CO2. So before we move on to the example on slide 16, do we have any questions about how to do this? That's like not even a thing. So 0.15. Sorry about that. So in this case, questions. If we don't have any, we'll look at the next example. If you think about questions here in just a second, um, I will leave this up. So Sebastian asks, the number that correlates to R is a given number. That is correct. Um, Sam retracted her questions. So Thomas asked, where did the 273 come from? 
So the 273 is how we convert Celsius into Kelvin. So to get Kelvin, it is degrees Celsius plus 273.15. So this equation will be provided on your equation sheet. So if the balance equation were a ratio of two to one, then would you multiply the answer? So Alice is thinking ahead to use the balance chemical equation. So um, hold on, let me bring a chair over because otherwise I'm awkwardly sitting. So, okay. So Alice asked about the balance equation. So it would be important if we asked about the moles of calcium carbonate, but in this case, it only asked about CO2. So you can calculate between the two. Um, and we will have an example for that, I think later today, but if not today, then for sure on first thing on Wednesday. Um, Yes, Kelly, R is based on what info you have. So there are other versions. If the pressure had been in TOR, there is an R value for that. Um, Isvari asked, what was the thing when K and C was the same and why did it change? It is a great question. Luckily, I feel like I can read your mind. So what you are remembering is in chapter five where you calculate delta T. So if you calculate the change in temperature, 273.15. So I don't know if that cut out, but the answer to is, it's okay, I'm here for you, it's all right. Um, I was afraid it was lagging. So I'll go back and tell you the thing. So the when they were the same was when you were calculating delta T, so delta T is the same because you can subtract five degrees Celsius plus 10 degrees Celsius and get a value. But in Kelvin, the delta between the two would still be five because we just add the 273 to both values. I'm sorry for my technical complications, but I'm glad I could answer the question. Any other questions? Um, or we can start to look at the example on slide 16. Oh, wait, I need that sentence. Okay, so the next one. I'll read it to you as slow as possible. And we're on slide 16 in chapter 10. So tennis balls are usually filled with either mixed air or nitrogen gas to a pressure above atmospheric pressure to increase their bounce. If a tennis ball has a volume of 144 centimeters cubed and contains 0.33 grams of nitrogen gas, what is the pressure in atmospheres inside the ball at 24 degrees Celsius? So like with most of them, we started at one level and now we're going to level up. This one is a little bit more close, not close. Um, it is more similar to what you'll see on Alex where it's going to ask you to do a whole bunch of calculations and then be like, see, now do this. So in this case, tennis ball that's filled with air. So now we're going to do example two. Example two. So we're going to ask for PV equals NRT. So it asks for the pressure. So we know that our final equation will be P equals NRT over V. So the question gives us a variety of information. So we have that the volume is 144 cubic centimeters. We know that the moles is going to be 0 0.33 grams. And for temperature, it is 24 degrees Celsius. So all three of these are going to have to be modified in order to go into this equation, regardless of what R value you choose. I'm going to use the same R value that I always use. You have the opportunity to choose something else because there's one that uses meters squared and other things. 
I'm going to stick with the one I like. You don't have to. You can pick a different one. No matter how you get there, the answer will be the same. So I'm going to convert my volume into liters so that I can use the R value I'd like. So 144 centimeters cubed and one cubic centimeter, it's one milliliter. And there are 1,000 mils in one liter. So this unit conversion, one centimeter to one milliliter, is something we talked about a lot in chapter one. So we know that the volume is going to be the moles. Now, it's been like so long, so long, since we've converted grams to moles. So if you remember, and if you don't, I'm about to tell you how to do it. So to convert grams to moles, we need to use the molar mass. The molar mass is the sum of the atomic weights for the elements on their periodic table. So we're going to take our 0 0.33 grams of N2, and the molar mass of nitrogen is going to be 28.02 grams in one mole. So when we plug this into our calculator, we are going to get 0 0.011. And so we also again need to calculate the temperature. So it's 24 degrees Celsius plus 273.15 Kelvin. And that gives us 297.15. So from here, whoa, we can, ow, we can now plug this back into our equation and we can get an answer. So N is going to equal, I'm going to move this way over so that I don't have to squish my numbers as much. So N is equal to 0 0.01178 mole, R 0 0.08206 liters atmospheres, mole, Kelvin. I've run out of space, so I'm doing something that we would not tend to do. Um, so from here, I'm going to add in the temperature, which is 297.15 Kelvin. And then we're going to divide by the volume, which is 0 0.1 for four liters. When we plug this into our calculator, we get 1.99 atmospheres. And now our least favorite friends are going to come back. Sig figs. So significant figures come out of the problem. And so the because this is division, the number of significant figures and the answer is the smallest number of sig figs in the problem. So both the moles in 0.33 or the temperature in 24 only have two sig figs. So using, can you see that? Yeah. Significant figures, we're going to get to 2.0 atmospheres. So the Katie asks, do you round conversions at the end or how many digits do you keep? I tend to try to keep several because it makes this answer more accurate. Um, I, my rule of thumb for conversions or multiplications like the moles up here is to keep an extra one, two digits usually. So if we have two, then I would go ahead and keep four. Um, that allows you to keep it. You can also round all along the route. And in this case, you should still get two as your final answer. Do we have any other questions about this example? So, it doesn't look like there are as many questions, but if you have some, if it's lagged, go ahead and write them in. 
I will talk through before I start erasing, and then we'll kind of go from there. So PB equals NRT is super great. It's also quite simple. And so it wouldn't be Gen Chem 1 if we weren't going to take it, take something very simple, put it into a blender, mix it up, and make it something very hard and complicated. So the other thing we want the opportunity to do is to compare different environments. And so what about if we think back to Charles's law or Boyle's law, we often said, well, everything else is constant. So we want to start to be able to say, okay, let's think about the tennis ball. What is the change in the pressure if we can vary one thing, but everything else is the same? So what we can start to do is adapt PB equals NRT where parts of it are the same. So when we think about the variations or deviations of any of this, we can start to think about basically what happens if parts of PV equals NRT are the same. So let's think about a situation where we know that PV equals NRT but we are going to take the same container. So now we're gonna think about our tennis ball. But the number of moles, the rate constant, and the temperature are all the same. So if we were to think about two, to, two conditions, we're going to change the pressure. But we're still at the same number of moles and the temperature. So we want to start to think about how P1, V1 equals NRT is also related to P2, V2. So the reason we can set these equations equal to each other is because our, our container is the same. So we still have the same number of moles and temperature. And now we can look at P1, V1 equals P2, V2. So in this case, all we're doing is changing the con conditions. So R is always the same. That's great. So we're basically saying that in addition to R, the number of moles and the temperature are constant. Now, in any of these situations, you can actually go through the full ideal gas law at any time. This is kind of like a shorthand somewhat similar to M1V1 equals M2V2, same philosophy, but not necessarily the same exact thing. So we have P1V1 equals P2V2. So this is option number one. We could also think about P1V1 over T1 of this. Moles don't tend to be used, but they can. So what you'll see in Alex with these is that it'll basically say under the following conditions, and then it will give you some of the information. Now, the way I like to ask these is I would just not give you the moles or the temperature. Um, if we have a vessel that is at this temp pressure and volume and something about the other part, what happens here? So I think... So far, one of the issues with this is that it kind of feels like she's just making up stuff. I got you. So if we look at slide 18, this is an example of what that might be like. The pressure in an aerosol can, like spray paint, old school hairspray, like the cans where it like shh, um, or like Pam cooking spray. So the pressure in an aerosol can is 1.5 atmospheres at 25 degrees Celsius. When the can is heated to 450 degrees Celsius, what is the pressure inside the can? Now you'll notice none of these are equations that I showed you, but we can assume that if something is constant, we can remove it from the situation. So we'll call this example, example what's slide on? Slide 18. 
That way, if you're re-watching this, you can figure out where we are. So, so on slide 18, we're thinking about this aerosol can. So in this case, we have P1 over P2. No, P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2, which is very similar to the one with the volume also added in, but the volume is the constant. So we have pressures and temperatures. So it's always worth writing out what you know, figure out what you don't know. So P1 in this case is 1.5 atmospheres. P T1 is 25 degrees Celsius. P2 is what I want to know. T2 is 450 degrees Celsius. So now we're going to go ahead and convert to Kelvin. So this will end up being 298.15 Kelvin, and this is going to be 723.15 Kelvin. Now, now we're going to plug this in to solve 1.5 atmospheres divided by 298.15 Kelvin equals P2 divided by 723.15. Kelvin. When you plug this into your calculator, P2 comes out to 3.638 atmospheres using our handy dandy sig figs, which is two based on the problem, we get 3.6 atmospheres. Now, Uh, so Isvari asks if it's at constant pressure. Well, it's not at constant pressure because we're looking for a second pressure. If you're asking, how do I know it's at constant volume? Because we can assume that it's the same can, we can assume that the volume and the moles are going to be the same. Um, I hope that answers your question. But the other question you might be wondering is, so in P1, B1 equals, no, in um, M1, B1 equals M2, B2, we don't have to change the volume into a specific unit. As long as they're the same, we can leave it alone. You might be wondering, well, why can't we do that here? So it turns out if you don't convert because you're dividing instead of multiplying, The volume is constant. So in this case, so if temp increases, pressure increases as well, could we assume that volume increases? Um, for So in Kelly's question, if it's not the same situation, yes. So if you were calculating that, in some cases, the answer to your question would be yes. But in this case, because we have an aerosol can, it is, it can't, the volume can't, decrease or um, expand. So if we were to leave these two values as the pressures or as the temperatures out in the problem, we would take 1.5 atmospheres, divide that by 25 degrees Celsius equals P2 and 450 Celsius. When we solve for P2, you guys still see this? Yes. You get 27 atmospheres. So I wrote this in red for two reasons. For, well, not two. One, to be festive, and two, to show you that this is wrong. So we have to convert these into the 273 because the temperature must be in the right units. This is different than dilutions where it doesn't matter as long as they're the same. In this case, because the what we're really saying is that these are equal to a constant and that constant requires you to be in Kelvin. So you must convert to Kelvin. So on slide 19, there is another example. Um, I think the best plan 
would be for us to, to stop for today. Um, I'm happy to answer questions about this. If you have some, we will pick up on slide 19 on Wednesday. So if you, my recommendation, so in class, I often was like, go home, try this, and then we'll pick up there for 15 right after class. Um, I am going to try to pull some review questions for Wednesday's lecture. I will post those in the announcements folder. It'll just say review questions um, so that we can do that. If you guys have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, I can let you guys, I'm gonna let you guys go like 90 seconds early. Feel free to give slide 19 a shot. If you have questions tonight, you can pop into office hours. They start at 545. Megan will be having lots of SI this week and our final is next week. I miss you guys like time for having a safe day. And if you're interested in my cookie recipe, send me an email. It's so good. I will hang out for another couple seconds, but if you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, I will see you all on Wednesday. I can't believe the semester's over. And that we didn't get to hang out again. I feel cheated. All right. Miss you guys. Oh, wait. Oh, Katie. I just never called it that. So the valence bond theories, we did learn that. I just call it Vesper. So Vesper is in long expanded form valence bond theory, something or other. Um, in that case, you did learn that. I just didn't call it that. They are not sugar-free at all. I would call these sugar-full cookies. I don't really care for sugar-free anything. Yeah, I'll send you the recipe. Um, or I'll send you the link to where I got the recipe on the internet. So there's that. Um, it does include hybridization. So chapter nine is what your friend is asking about. We did not talk about um, it depends on what they were asking about valence bond theories. You're welcome to send me an email and I can try to any other questions. Have a fantastic rest of your Monday and stay stay safe, I guess. I don't know. Have a good one. Miss you guys.